First of all, thank you all very much for coming along. Uh, we are delighted to see so many here to join with the families and the uh, Louis Leonard coming here in Newton Butler to mark the 50th anniversary of the murder of Michael Nan and Andrew Murray. We have a very distinguished panel here uh, who I'm going to hand over to in a moment to uh, take forward the proceedings. Uh, we're Looking forward to uh, hearing Brian's contribution to the uh, extra evidence uh, that has been unearthed since the book, uh, The Pitchfork Motors, was published some 10 years ago. Hard to believe 10 years has gone by from the 40th anniversary. We have Betty here, uh, Betty Leonard, uh, who is going to give us a little bit of the uh, contextualize uh, 72 and 73 and of course the panel here is going to be uh, chaired by Michelle Gildenew. So we have uh, a number of speakers here and I'm not going to hold up proceedings any longer uh, and I'll hand over to Michelle. Um, it's great to be here with you all this evening and I'm delighted to see such a turnout, especially delighted to see so many young people because if we don't learn from our past, we are doomed to repeat it and the failures of the past. I just want to say a big thank you to the Sheridan family, to Russian and Catherine Bulabos. Thanks a million for your music. And I only plan to talk for a, a couple of minutes here now. You're here primarily to listen to Brian, and I know I could listen to him all night. Um, these are very difficult times, as you know, and while it's 10 years from Brian's, the book was published on the Pitchfork Murders, I think we all know now a lot more than we did then about the extent of collusion, about what went on, about how um, gangs of, param of loyalists were, were armed and given intelligence and aided and abetted by the RUC and the UDR and others. So, you know, when 10, 15 years ago they were telling us that collusion was just Sinn Féin propaganda and I think now everybody accepts that it really happened. And in the middle of all of this, the current British government, who as of right now don't have a prime minister, but the current British government are bringing forward legislation on legacy. Every single party on the island of Ireland is opposed to that legislation. Every single party, including the DUP and the UUP and the TUV and others, every single party on this island is opposed to that legislation. Every single party, and I have taken place in debates in London, every party, the Lib Dems, Labour, the SNP, Plaid Cymru, are all against this legislation. The only people who are bringing it forward are the Tories. Now, we're not stupid, we know why that is. We know that decisions were taken in number 10 Downing Street throughout the conflict about people that they wanted taken out. And whether that was Michael and Andrew, whether it was Sheena Campbell or Pat Finucan or whatever, we know decisions were made in London about who they would take out of the picture and who were the, the people most likely to help us succeed in our vision of unity. And, you know, they, they did that and they created a, a, 
A Sense of Fear, um, and Kid Wilder's book, if any of you've got it, um, is, is worth a read. And the, the general at the time talked about poison in the water. So creating that level of fear within nationalist communities that they refuse to provide safe houses or refuse to provide any kind of assistance and that they were just couldn't trust anybody or didn't know who to trust. And we know that the British government's policies in Ireland have been reprehensible. We know that they were there wasn't a low to which they wouldn't stoop. And we know this because we've also seen it in Kenya and India and other places that they colonised. And we were their first colony and we're, we're still the last. We've had 800 years of oppression in this country. We've had 800 years of, of British oppression and that is coming to an end. And these are probably still dangerous times and times that people are, are watching themselves. But this legislation, being no doubt, the legacy legislation is designed to ensure that the truth about Andrew and Michael's murder never comes out. That, that nobody knows how low the British government would stoop and the, the, the policies that they would utilize in order to break the Republican struggle. So I'm going to leave it at that. I'm going to maybe say a few words after Brian, but put that in context. Think about this, these legacy proposals and, and what it means for us here in Fermanagh, to ordinary nationalist communities living along the border and the fear and the, the um, oppression that was visited upon these communities. And we don't need to look any further than Betty Leonard either for, for the suffering, but there's so many people in this room have suffered as a result of the conflict and we need to keep fighting that battle to ensure that the, the family families get justice that they get, if not their day in court, that they get the truth of what happened. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what Brian has to say and looking forward to the engagement afterwards. And we're handing over to Brian now. Gormila Maogov. I'm quite nervous here. I don't know why, because it, it, it doesn't seem 10 years since we were here the last time. And it was in or about the same time, and I made the point then when I was starting my remarks uh, that um, we're actually sitting here at a point now, about six o'clock, shortly after six, when the operation had begun. The operation had begun just out the road here at Ahna Hinch that led uh, to the brutal slaying of uh, Michael Nan and Andy Murray. Michael Nan, just, just I, I know there are a lot of young people here and, and that there, and I, I don't want to go particularly into the, the detail of, of, of the savagery of their killing, but there was certainly nothing like it throughout the entire conflict. This, this was a, a standalone event in terms of its horror and its, its impact on this community. And, and in a much wider community across Fermanagh, and you can get that from the newspapers at the time, and I know many people like myself remember it. We remember I was just gone 15, you know, I was in school in Monaghan, but um, a childhood friend of mine was Paul Johnson, and uh, this was Paul's uncle, so it brought it home to us, I suppose, in a way that previous incidents hadn't, and, and, and the, 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 the impression that got out, this word, the pitchfork murders, you know, this got out into quick circulation and, and the terror that spread. In fact, my uncle, who was here 10 years ago, Eugene McCabe, um, wrote a play uh, called Victims, uh, Our Heritage and Other Stories. And in that there, he depicts what he and the rest of us thought had happened that day. And he, of course, like many of us, thought that it was uh, a loyalist killing. It was um, a UDR gang, maybe. And in, in, in the play, that was what we, he depicted. And, and there was this sense over the years of really not knowing who or why these, this farmer and, and Andy Murray, who was laboring with him, why they had been killed and why the brutality of this particular killing. And, and, and it was only in 1978, in May 1978, uh, Helen Ritka is um, a young 18-year-old prostitute in Huddersfield in England, is murdered. She's murdered by the Yorkshire Ripper, Peter Sutcliffe. But Sutcliffe isn't captured or found out for several years after that. And it's thought by a former soldier in a Scottish regiment called the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders, he said to himself, there's something about these murders, the way these women are being killed, the way the knife has been wielded, that, that tells me that it's a former colleague of mine, a former 
comrade of mine in the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders who is the Yorkshire Ripper. And part of the reason he believed that was because the Sutherland, the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders at that stage were based at Catterick Barracks, which was close to Huddersfield. And therefore, he made a connection. There was no connection, it has to be said. But he came forward. He, he was troubled by what had happened here this day, this evening, 50 years ago. And he went to the police. He went to the police in Yorkshire first, and he reported it there in, in May, first of all, in May, shortly after the murder of Helen Ritka. And then nothing happened. He came back in June. He reported it again. He made phone calls. He reported it again in July. And eventually in December, he walked into a newspaper, in, in, with a newspaper journalist into a police barracks in Edinburgh, and he said, I believe that this guy, I think his name was Hathaway, Stan Hathaway, is the Yorkshire Ripper. And this is why I think it is, because when we were in Fermanagh, he and others slaughtered two farmers in County Fermanagh, and, and he, he enjoyed the killing. They enjoyed the killing. And that was the start of, if you like, the uncovering of the story of what had happened here 50 years ago. So what did happen? Well, we know that that Saturday, it was a Monday, and that Monday was a bright autumn day after a dry autumn period. And himself and Andy had, had taken a load, a trailer load of sticks from the farm at Ochnahinch, down to Derry Kenny, down at Wattle Bridge, where, where Andy Murray lived with his mother, Mary Ann. And they delivered the load of sticks. They were seen coming back up the road, I think passing McCaffrey's Mill, in or about 5, 5.15. So they were coming back up to On Hinch for in or about 6 o'clock. And when they got there, they may have had something to eat because there was food left on the table. But they didn't get to finish whatever to eat because at that stage, an operation was swinging into place that would lead to their deaths at the hand of the soldiers. Who were these soldiers? These soldiers, as I said, were members of the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders. They weren't even based in Fermanagh. They had their first posting. It was a regiment that was made infamous during the Aden occupation, the occupation in Aden. Now, now um, uh, they, they were under Mad Mitch, many of you will remember the, 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 the coverage at the time. But they were a regiment that were known for their hard man image. They reckoned that the, the paratroopers were like Boy Scouts against the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders. They thought themselves the toughest of the toughest. They were in your face. And in the, um, the, the soldier who came forward about Nan and Murray and other soldiers who had served at that time provided a litany of crimes committed by the Argyles in, in Aden. But the Argyles were reformed as part of the preparations for Operation Motorman, which began at the end of July 1972, and they were sent to Bestbrook in County Armagh. They were covering South Armagh. They were under the command of a particular major, a major Jeremy McKenzie. Remember that name? Remember that name, because when that man dies, he will be lauded as this great doyen, denizen of the British Empire, because he was that from their perspective. He is also the man, as he will explain this evening, who orders the execution of Michael Nan and Andy Murray, and he is the man who is primarily responsible for the cover-up in the succeeding years. In fact, the entire cover-up, you could say, was designed to protect his military career because he was a rising star. Just to explain, Jeremy McKenzie was the son of a very famous um, general in, in the British Army who had been involved in the African wars. He was actually educated in Nairobi and then from there he went to Sandhurst, where he was one of the top students in the military academy at Sandhurst. And he was sent there from Borneo to suppress the, the, a rebellion in Borneo. While in Borneo, he was 21 years of age. He was co-opted, he was working with the SAS and working with SIS, MI6. He was remembered particularly in that there he, he learned about camping out and he would reflect, this was reflected in what happened in Fermanagh. 
he, 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 was, he camped out, but throughout his time there, he wore his knapsack with the skull of a human being attached to the back of his knapsack. Who was this human being? This was a human who was killed in the 19th century during a previous uprising by the people of the area that had been suppressed by the British. And he, wore, he carried the skull of this human being on his knapsack around Borneo during his operation. He called the skull Charlie, which of course in, 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 in common parlance, in England, a right Charlie, a fool, a nothing, something to be... So, so this was the man who was in command of the regiment uh, when they were based in Bessbrook. They were sent here on the 20th of October, Friday the 20th of October in 1972, as a, as a supplement to a mil military operation that had been going on for several weeks that stretched from Castle Derg, from West Tyrone, right around to the Newton Butler, Rossley area, and the borders were County Monaghan. And they were sent here, really, to start getting in the face of people. There had been several IRA actions in the area, including um, um, a, a number of UDR soldiers who were killed, including um, um, Jack Creighton, uh, or what's it, Jack, sorry, uh, Creighton from Maravilli and others. So they were sent to, to take a more, because they took an aggressive approach. So it was in-your-face reporting. What happens when they get here? Well, when they get here, they are posted to a number of places. The first place that they set up camp is, is um, between where the Kiltork checkpoint was and Clontivran in the townland of, um, is it Clonagon? And that was strategically placed because it gave them sight of the road, the main new town to Clonus Road. It gave them sight also across to the Wattle Bridge Road, but more importantly, it gave them sight over the home of Philip MacDonald who was an IRA volunteer, and they were, they were watching that area first. They only stayed there a day. Another section of the, there were three, um, there were three um, troops, if you like, three platoons. So, so this is 13 and 14 are in Clonagon, but 15 are, are posted elsewhere. They're posted north of Newtown Butler. On Saturday, however, or Sunday, I beg your pardon, there is the, um, um, Robin Bell, a UDR soldier who was commemorated here early this afternoon, and indeed, obviously, his family and, and his community deserve to remember him and his loss at that time. He is shot dead in an ambush on Sunday morning, and the two platoons are pulled from Clonagon back to Sandholes, which is directly overlooking on Inch, the farm at On Inch, and also back towards the Newton Butler to Galoon Road. And from this vantage point, they can view Mike and Nan's farm. But something else happens that day, and it happens several miles away. One of the soldiers in 15 platoon goes missing. He just disappeared. So there's a frenetic search, and we knew about this. We knew about this from Deglin O'Moan when we were making the program on what had happened. We knew from the statements that a soldier had gone missing, but he turned up later in, to listen to Ski Barracks, and so we thought nothing more about it. But it was the disappearance of this soldier that apparently justified or led to the assassination or the killing of Michael Nan. And, and by default, Andy Murray. Um, the record in, in a book published by um, Edward Burke, it suggests that this soldier went missing on the Monday, on the day when, when Michael Nan is killed. But actually, it was probably the day before or even on the Saturday that he'd gone missing. I can't quite put my hands on the record, but I do know that um, he was missing for quite a while. And it coincidentally, purely coincidentally, Platoon 15 were based up at, at, at Great Reeve, up in a, a little area called the Folly in Great Reeve. And the soldiers came down to the farm at Baltre and they met the Lynches. 
They met James Josie Lynch and two of his sons, Peter and Kevin Lynch. And they said, have you seen him? Have you seen a soldier? Have you seen a soldier? And they remembered the incident. I talked to Kevin about this sometime. He, he, he had connected anything with it. But they were definitely Scottish soldiers. And being young fellas, and only cubs at the time, they were curious, what's all this about? And they went wandering. And they came across a helicopter. And it wasn't a troop carrier helicopter. It was a scout helicopter. So clearly, officer, probably Major Mackenzie himself, had come in search. They were frenetic searching for this soldier who was Fluff Owens was his name I think his proper name is probably William Owens who had gone missing and and as I said they they were so desperately searching for him and they were in such a tizzy they went back to information that had been provided by the local UDR intelligence officer here in Newtown Butler of um, Company C for UDR, and that was, of course, uh, Major uh, Little, Albert Little. And Major Albert Little is the one who points them towards Michael Nan. Why does Major Little point them towards Michael Nan? Well, Major Little was a nephew of the family that sold the farm to the Bogues in 1923. In fact, Albert Little was three years of age when the farm at On Edge was sold. Three years of age. But it had, let's just say there were issues. Bogues wasn't a, a familiar name in this area. You know, it would be more familiar around by the Clougher Valley. But in this area, it was a mistaken sale. And um, William Brooks and his wife Charlotte, who's Charlotte um, little, sell the farm unbeknownst to Bogues, not knowing what it is. When it's discovered that Bogues are actually cattle, you've got to remember this is the time just after partition. This is a time when the Clogher Fund has been established. What's the Clogher Fund? The Clogher Fund was established by the Orange to encourage families, Church of Ireland, Methodist families, Protestant families, south of the border to relocate to County Fermanagh all along the border from Monaghan through Cavan into Leitrim. Hundreds of families come. We, have, we did an article on it in the, in the Clotter Historical Society Journal in 1992, and there's a census of the families. And of course, it led to devastation for the Protestant communities left behind that lost so many of their members. So, so at that time, when literally the agenda, if you like, of the Unionist Party was to liquidate the nationalist majority in Fermanagh. Here was a family moving into the area, Bogues moving into this area, and that simply wasn't acceptable. So Bogues discovered two graves dug in front of the old barn out towards the roadway in, 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 a, in a boggy field. Two graves were discovered, which, which was a, an, an ominous sign when you know what happened later on, but clearly it was a threat at the time, and they regarded it as a threat. But they got on with life, and, and um, the farm was bought by the Nans in the 1940s, or 1937, I beg your pardon. And Joseph Nan was clearly a, a, a very industrious farmer, and, uh, and they had other holdings. They had holdings out at Killalahard, or, or out around Killard, out around ports where the family had come from. So, so when... when the Bogues sold and moved to Cavan, and Nans moved into the farm. And, and in 1967, Joseph Nan dies, and Michael takes over the farm. And like that, he's what would be called nowadays, I suppose, a progressive farmer, in that he's out there, and he's, he's, he's building up the, the, the whole enterprise. He'd moved from dairy into dry stock sucklers, and, and he was clearly making progress. And... and, and, and this young man who was three years of age when, when the farm was bought carried, carried that resentment, carried that hatred in his heart all those years. Of course, Albert became a UUP councillor in this area. He was, the, 
he was the commander of the Ulster Special Constabulary here for 10 years before the, the UDR was formed after the disbandment of the B Specials. You know, so he, he was, he, he, and another person who's mentioned, of course, in relation to this uh, giving information to the army is Sam Foster. But it doesn't list Sam Foster as given any specific information. Simply, he's named in the affidavits as somebody who's providing information. And the point was that it was very personal in this area. I think all of us who were around at the time and remember how personal it was being stopped by neighbours, being questioned by neighbours, being asked your name by neighbours, and there was that friction always in the Newtown Butler area, as there was throughout Fermanagh and, and indeed throughout all of the north, you know, uh, that, that, that residual resentment and, and, and there was that residual hatred that was there in, in some people that, that really, based on prejudice, based on, on, on that blind hatred of other, and, and, and unfortunately, that's what played in, the information, the list that the Argyles relied on that week was the list supplied by, by Major Little. This is according, of course, to the um, Argyles themselves. And, and he had been included on that list and, and was given prominence as an intelligence officer. Michael Lamb was an intelligence officer. He was also the quartermaster and he was, he was everything. But of course, he was none of these things. Michael Lamb was not. I remember, in fact, it's, it's, it's only when Louis Leonard is killed uh, amongst later or murdered in December that it's revealed that Louis Leonard was actually the quartermaster of the IRA in this area. So, so they created a, a mystique around Mike and Nan. The soldiers were based in sand holes. They were looking down at the farm, and a decision was made to kill him. Now, the point about this, and we made the point 10 years ago, and, and it's the most important point, and maybe it was missed by thing. There are two platoons involved in the murder. There is 13 platoon. A platoon is about 24, 28 soldiers in it. So we have platoon 13, which is primarily involved. Stan Hathaway is a member of that platoon, as is John Brennan Maguire and John McFadgen Byrne. As you can see, there was nothing sectarian about this. These were soldiers of the, of the Argyle Regiment, and they did what soldiers do. They didn't give a toss what religion these people were. This was on a mission. They were, um, kind of got lost a wee bit there, but their information, as I said, came from, came, came from a particular source, and they became focused on that. So we know what happened. They came to the farm, they killed Michael Nan, and it's a full 24 hours later. We don't know how long they were on the farm, because it's very interesting. From the statements of the soldiers, the various affidavits, some soldiers are saying they didn't come back to camp until 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. Other soldiers say it was about midnight. And yet, here we are now, what time is it now? It's about 6.33, and we know that they were heading for the farm at this point. We know that the operation was beginning now. We know that Oliver Malarkey travels the road at 6.45 and he sees soldiers on a, on a blackface unit that their berries turned inside out. They were blacked up and he sees them and they're looking down the lane towards Nan's farm at Ohnenge. We know at 7.30 that Dimpna Sheridan comes along the same road and she sees a patrol but she sees something else. She sees a Morris Minor car sitting there and the soldiers talking into it. And as she slows down, thinking it's a checkpoint, the Morris Minor car is parked on the right-hand side of the road facing you down. It takes off. She thinks she sees two soldiers inside and it takes off. And then she is quickly waved on. Move on, move on, move on. And she does. The... Operation was happening then, so how long did it happen? What we know is that there was an interrogation of Michael Nan because there were marks to his throat where a knife had been held to his throat and drawn across it. And then, of course, he was stabbed at least 17 times and 
and Andy Murray 13 times, front and back. He was turned over during the slain and, and, and stabbed more. What's interesting about the stab marks, apart from the fact that they happened, is that they were all in the same place, in or about the same place, which the coroner, two day, this is two days after the event, the coroner says this person was totally pinned. They could not move. They did not move. There was no sign of resistance. So there were obviously quite a number of people. When the soldier A comes in and the whole thing begins to come out about what has happened, the fabrication, the real story is hidden. The real story, what is put forward then is the premise, and we're all asked to believe this here, that Stan Hathaway, a sergeant in the Argyles who was known for loyalty and for devotion to his officers, a totally loyal soldier, had taken it upon himself along with... Um, John McFadden Bourne, a corporal, one of his corporals, John Brennan Maguire, the radio operator. And who's the fourth soldier that mentioned? Ian Fletcher Chestnut. Ian Chestnut. But here's the thing Ian Chestnut isn't a member of 13 Platoon. Ian Chestnut is a member of 14 Platoon. Why is that important? Because it means that Captain Snowball, the officer in charge of 13 platoon, cannot have given the order for that patrol. He cannot have done it. The order had to come from the senior company commander, and that was Major Mackenzie. We know more now, because in recent years, a book has come out, published by Edward Burke, a book called Army of Tribes. And he managed to get hold of, because well, one of the things that's interesting about this case is how quickly documents went missing after the murders. All sorts of documents went missing. However, one of the solicitors involved in the trial of the soldiers, probably the solicitor for Ian Chestnut, because he wasn't defended by the army, kept the files, kept all the affidavits. So Edward Bourke had a lot of the information and a lot of additional statements that we didn't have 10 years ago when we were researching this story. So now we know that there was actually an affidavit from, from, from the company sergeant, John Higgins. Why is that important? And John Higgins, what's he saying? John Higgins is saying, yes, I was there, we were watching it. We were watching it. John Higgins could not have moved without Major McKenzie. That was his role in the army. That was the role of the company sergeant, was to accompany the, the major on every operation. Of course they were together. And when the people from this area went to the site afterwards and searched, they found out where they had been hiding, behind a little concrete building, not 200 yards from the actual farm itself. They cannot have not known what was happening. We also know now from other soldiers that they, who say that it wasn't just four soldiers went out, a full platoon went out, or a full, uh, sorry, a section went out. What's a section? A section is eight soldiers. A section went out. So no, we're no longer talking about four soldiers. We're talking about eight soldiers, and at least one of those comes from a different company. So, so once we begin to piece all this together, we can see that it was a coordinated, planned a planned visit to the farm, and the outcome was clearly indicated to, to um, Stan Hathaway before he went there. Because Stan Hathaway, and all of the documents say this, Stan Hathaway was a loyal and, and, and uh, very much obedient officer. He had served in Aden. He was no, he's, he's no gilded lily. He was a tough. He was a tough, and he was in your face, and he was in the face of Michael Nan, and, and, and he was doing everything he did that evening was at the behest of his commander. So the whole cover-up begins immediately. We're, we're meant to think that actually Snowball, but how are they going to mention Snowball without mentioning Snowball? Because don't forget, Snowball's daddy, Snowball is royalty like, like Major Mackenzie. He's, this is a story about class, right? And, and Snowball is the son of Brigadier Ted Snowball, another doyen of the British Army in Scotland, who's also big buddies with Lord Ern. 
Indeed, he'd been based in Crum Castle during the Second World War, he and his, his um, troops. And he's also friendly with General Leach, who's the head of the Scottish Army in Scotland, GOC of the Scottish Army in Scotland. So you see all of these personal connections that are there. On the one time, how do we protect Major Mackenzie? Because he's going on. He's going on to big things. He goes on to become a four-star general, second in command to the NATO forces in Europe. Today, he's making money selling equipment to NATO. This is Major McKenzie. He's, he's big news. So how do we land Captain Snowball in it without really landing him in it? So what to do is they say that Snowball actually, well, he only heard about it afterwards. And he decided, well, I must cover this up for the good of the army. So he says that he disposes of the knife and blah, 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 all blah, blah, blah. There is not a word of it true. He is as involved as all. He's only 20 years old. He's the youngest officer in the British Army. And it's interesting when it comes to the trial, his papa and, and the General Leach head down to London and make sure that he gets the best legal representation from within the armed services. So he's treated totally different. He, he doesn't do time in jail. Whereas, whereas Hathaway and Byrne and Chestnut are put into jail um, during the, the remand process, he doesn't go to jail. He's in military custody and he gets one year suspended because he didn't know. And the judge, Judge McDermott, he thanks them. He thanks them for, for, for um, pleading guilty and, and he sympathizes with them for how difficult it must have been, even though they've been pleading not guilty, because Hathaway was adamant that he was not going to please, gil, plead guilty. But they had to get him to plead guilty. Why? Because Chestnut was no longer in the army. Chestnut had left. He'd found Jesus. He'd found religion. And they were terrified that he was going to get up and tell what actually happened. Because in his statements, he is saying this was an army-oriented operation. This was, this was planned. We were acting under orders. So they cannot let him get up. So they had to persuade Hathaway and Byrne to take the can. They were the patsies. They were the fall guys. They were the troops. They were the working class lads in uniform who had to take, carry the can for what happened. It's interesting that in the years of investigation, if it can just, if you don't, if you can, wait a wee while. I want to tell you about the investigation. Because the, the investigation is really interesting in its early stages because it's led by uh, Detective Inspector Patrick Gilligan from Enniskillen. And he genuinely tries to get to the truth. And he comes down and he gets, it's him, I presume, took the statement from Oliver, um, Oliver Malarkey and from Dimpna Sheridan. And you can see that by early November, the very beginning of November, he's getting the message from all around Newtown, telling them, look at the troops were all over that place the day before. They were every, all over. We, you know, we saw British soldiers. And of course, he is dimping a Sheridan statement to say that the soldier had a Scottish accent, had an accent. So she know, they know this here. So he goes then to St. Angelo Barracks, to British military intelligence, and he says, can you give us the documents relating to the patrols from that day. Here's nothing. So then he makes a, a visit. Uh, he, he visits again, and he looks for a personal visit with the head of British military intelligence in St. Angelo Barracks, and that is Captain Rees. Remember that name. And Captain Rees tells him, no, there were no army patrols in that area that day. None. Okay? But he's not satisfied. Something about him, you know? He says, has all the people around Newtown gone mad altogether, playing mad? Were they all seeing things? And, and he goes back again. He then goes to the Special Investigation Branch of the British Army. He goes back to his own superiors. He's getting too close. He's asking too many questions. And he's taken off the case through ill health for a while, and a detective, Inspector McAtamney, takes over the case in January, so one, or in December. And one of the things 
that we have from McAtamney in the HET report. There was a HET report published. That's a historical inquiries team report done this year. We know that when McAtamney does, what does he do? He goes back to Dimpna Sheridan because she's the danger. She's the danger. She has got the accent. She has got the fact that they were soldiers. And he comes back and he says, I've spoken again to Dimpna Sheridan and she now accepts that perhaps they might have been UDR, that they might not have been blah, blah, blah. We can place no reliance on her statement. So they needed to get rid of her testimony because that puts the soldiers at the place at the time. They also tried to suggest that in the affidavits, John Brennan Maguire apparently says, it was me who was the soldier that waved her on and told her to go on. And this is at half seven, covered in blood, John Maguire, because they were all covered in blood. We know that from the other soldiers because they washed themselves in a tureen back at the camp. A bit, they washed themselves in front of arc lights from the trucks. It was like something from a, a Grecian kind of tragedy. They washed themselves surrounded by 17, at least 17 other soldiers laughing and joking and talking about blood and stabbing. This is not me. This is no propaganda. This is the evidence given by young, terrified soldiers who were there at the time. Because don't forget, the Argyles at that stage had just been reformed in July, or early in 1972. Most of the soldiers, the ordinary troopers, were 17, 18. They took Soldiers as young as 15 years of age, same age as I was at that point. They took them, and you can see the ages. They are incredibly young, most of them. But then there's these hard hands, the old hands. And that's what the soldiers say when they go into the barracks. They say it was the, the veterans, these hardened ones, who pushed the whole thing. So they come back into the camp. They're seen washing down, washing the blood off them in the middle of the night. And they're moved out. But we have reams and reams of statements. When he's interviewed in January 1973, Lord, or not Lord Aaron, he was never interviewed, God forbid. But they did interview Mackenzie. The SIB go to Scotland and interview Mackenzie, who tells lie after lie after lie. We are meant to believe, and unfortunately Edward Burke repeats this myth, we're meant to believe that they were searching in Ishvendra on the 23rd. That's where they were. They were over. This was a regiment that was brought in to get into the face of people, and they're over in Inishfendra searching the woods in Inishfendra. Unlikely. That's about keeping them away. He also claims that 14 platoon is actually based in Balik. So he split up his company, sent one class of them up to Balik, and the other two are, are, are left here in the Newtown Butler area. So, so nothing Nothing that we can read in his statement can be taken at face value. In fact, all of the statements have to be treated with circumspection. And with the, but but once, once we know how they operate, well, why was this easy for them? Just to bring you back, if you don't mind, they were based in South Armagh, when across Midland, one night, 9th of September, this is a month before the lads were killed. On the 9th of September, a car was stolen outside a, a dance, a, a hotel in Dundalk. And it turns up on the 18th of September in the road near um, Hackball's Cross, that area. And uh, the car belongs to a, 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 a guy from Warren Point who would have been associated with the officials, the sticks, the official Sinn Féin or whatever. And it was taken anyway. And he heads off to Dublin, but some of his friends, they're trying to, to find the car and, and to discover anyway it's, it's been left at this place here. So some of his friends are going to pick up the car. But they check, first of all, they check um, through Fork Hill, RUC station, and then through Cross Midland. They're told it's Cross Midland, you need to talk to me. They deal with Alex Moore, uh, a member of the Argyles, and, and he says, oh, that car's clear. Yes, it's safe to come in and take it up. And so they phone again to make sure, to make sure. And on their way across, they stop at Fork Hill Barracks and they say, well, we're on our way now to get that car. He was with two friends. Woolsey is his name, Edmund Woolsey, and two friends are, are O'Reilly and I forget the third. And they head over to get the car, and they're told, absolutely, this car has been checked, it's been cleared, you can pick it up. And of course, Woolsey, Edmund Woolsey, goes to the car, 
and there's no smell of marzipan. They opened the boot. There was no smell as if it had been a booby trap left by the IRA, but the car explodes when he gets in. He's blown to smithereens. And his two friends survive. But I suppose what's interesting about it is this whole thing. His feet were taken by the Argyles, attached to the front of a Saracen with a sign, this is one that won't run away. So the collection of trophies, of body parts, was part and parcel of the colonial experience. It was part and parcel, just like the head of Charlie in Borneo. They were just, we, we were, and, 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 that, I, I, and, and not simply Catholics, they didn't give a toss about, about the people. They were, they were a military discipline, a military force coming in to do a military job with absolute um, obedience to their officers. So, it's, it, 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 it's a, a, a cover-up of man, monumental pro proportions. There's no doubt about it. But the truth is there. The truth is there in the affidavits. We know the truth. We know the names of virtually every member of 13th Platoon. We know the names of all the members of 14th Platoon. All of those have, are, are material witnesses to that period, as is Major Mackenzie, at very least a witness, and certainly should be a suspect, as is uh, Captain Reese. And Captain Reese is, of course, the mover and shaker at that time. I firmly believe that it's from Captain Reese that we get the term. Because after the killing, how do the cop one of the things they do, they send up a clean up operation. They send in special unit in overalls, white overalls. They're stopped on the way into the farm by a British Army patrol, right, of the Argyles, and they're driving an estate car. And the patrol has been told to let no one in, so they contact Listen Escape Barracks, and they give the names. These guys says, oh, we're from Clonus. And so they contact Listen Escape Barracks, and they give the names of these guys, alleged names, and then they're told to let them on in. Hello. Does that make sense? Of course it doesn't make sense. It was, a, it was, a, 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 it was a, some attempt maybe at humor or, 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 or whatever. But what we do know is that when the... When Detective Inspector Gilligan leads a team in to do the search of the farm the day after John Hanna discovers the bodies, we know that they found no sharp implements, no picks, no pitchforks, no grapes, nothing. So clearly, whoever went into the cleanup didn't know what they'd been stabbed with. So they were taking no chances and they were taking away all sharp instruments. So all sharp instruments are taken away and 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 wherever they are. But it, it's remarkable that nowhere in the documentation do you see that did they contact Listen Ski Barracks to see do they have a log? They, like the soldiers say, we logged these people coming in and going back out. So surely there must have been a log at Listen Ski Barracks. And speaking of the RUC and the role, and clearly Inspector Gilligan was an exception. In, in, in the honest way he was dealing with this issue. But it's worth pointing out, the soldier A who came forward, the man who came forward and told the story initially in Edinburgh, his name was leaked to the killers by the RUC. We know that from Edmund Burke's book, Edward Burke's book. So, so you have this ongoing thing, and this is your, th th this awful continuity of cover-up, smear, misdirection, it's all there. This, this is a story. And I, I think we know the truth now. I think we know that Major uh, Mackenzie is the man behind the operation. But there are still bits to be tied up. You know, there are still, there are still questions that need to be answered. There are still um, issues. And in particular, the role of um, Captain Reese. Because the role of Captain Reese in that operation continues a few weeks later because in between this and the murder of Louis Leonard, Betty's husband, he's going around telling young people in the Canali area, you end up like Nan and Murray at Newton Butler. You end up like him. So he's connected to that there and that's by, um, carried out by um, a UDA gang from Newton Abbey, right? That's obviously at the service of the British military intelligence carrying out operations in the Fermanagh area. And then we find him cropping up again, the same Captain Rees, who, if any of you saw the documentary on the bombing in Bell Torbett, you'll have seen him pointing the finger of that bombing. He's interviewed. He's interviewed. And he 
points the finger at a publican in Listen Ski, uh, Jack Leary. He points the finger at Leary. And he's saying he's the guy that pulled all this together. He pulled it all together. Apparently, he must have been some military performer because he pulled together a coordinated bombing in Beltorbet, Clonus, and Pedigo on the same night. I'm delighted to hear that the Guardi have reopened the file on the Beltorbet bombing. And I really hope that they go to France and interview Captain Reese because that's where he lives now. This man has an awful lot of information and answers to give about what happened. The nightmare that the people in Fermanagh, that, a nightmare that was designed to drive people apart. It wasn't designed to bring communities together. It was designed to instill fear of neighbors, fear of one another. It was designed to project that, that British colonial notion that this was a war of, 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 between two communities. The, the colonial nature of the war, they always wanted to hide. And why were they behind the bombings in Dublin, in Clonus? There was a bombing in Clonus also on the October the 2nd, when Eugene Comiskey was injured in the butter yard. I remember it well. All of these can be connected to a campaign by British military intelligence because they knew that those bombings would force the government in Dublin to introduce stricter and stricter laws and to come down on the area. And that's exactly what happened. And Clonus, of course, was of particular interest to them because they couldn't stand Garda Patsy, Pascal McArdle they, because he wasn't cooperating with them. He was simply doing his duty, but he wasn't, he wasn't kowtowing, so they wanted him moved. They made regular moves. So, so all of this is going on. All of this has been coordinated. And don't forget, at the same time, too, we have the, that, 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 that killer squad of the British Army that was involved in, in, in a range of assassinations in Belfast. There's a unit also based in Enniskillen in this period. So I'm not going to go on any longer. I think I've said enough, but, but do remember, remember them. Because I, 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 I suppose to think that, that prejudice and hatred could lead someone to, to point the finger for slaughter at somebody. John Han, it's worth remembering that when John went out to, and, and having identified the bodies, having found, sorry, Andy Murray, and went back out to the farm with Sergeant Brown, uh, there were soldiers in the barracks, and Sean remembers them, and they were kind of laughing, having a giggle up the back, and he brought out Sergeant Brown and two officers, two, two ordinary members of the RUC, and they went out to the farm, and there was every evidence on that there that Sergeant Brown knew what he was going to find. Because when they found Andy Murray, he said, he said to the officers, he says, keep looking, he says, Mike and Nan's there. He knew he was there. They knew, of course they knew. It was a, it was a, it was a, a conspiracy of silence that, that, that was so wide, it's remarkable, that it con continued until 1978 even. But we're getting there. Truth comes dropping slowly. And, and here we are today remembering Michael Nan and Annie Murray and, and, and that awful period in our history. And I, I just think it's wonderful to see the family here, family members here, with members of the wider community here in Fermanagh and across the border in County Monaghan. For a meal, meal, and Gramila Mayogat, Brian. Um, that was a difficult lesson for John and for James and for family members and neighbours and friends of Andrew and uh, Michael. So I'm just conscious of that and I think we could all just collectively take a deep breath and gather ourselves because it certainly doesn't get any easier with the passage of time when you hear what, what uh, was done to us. So while people are just getting away and take a breath, I'm going to ask um, Martin McGovern to come up, he's going to do a wee poem. I've been told you are anyway, Martin, so. Thank you. This is just a few words I wrote as a perspective of a, as a five-year-old when the killings occurred. It's entitled, When I Was Small. When I was small, they killed the farmers. I didn't know them, but I heard about it. When I was small, they killed the farmers. I didn't know them, but they were Nan and Murray. 
When I was small, to kill the farmers, I didn't know why, so I asked my mother. When I was small, to kill the farmers, I didn't know the culprits, but they were British soldiers. When I was small, to kill the farmers, someone knew why and someone knew how. When I was small, to kill the farmers, I didn't know them, but they were Michael Nan and Andrew Murray. A woman who needs no introduction here tonight is Betty Leonard, and she's going to say a few words as well. So give her um, your, your best time, please. Could I just start off by saying one of the things that struck me when Brian was talking, when he was explaining about all the implements being taken away, he didn't say that uh, that's why it was called the Pitchfork Murders, because they weren't sure what instruments had actually been used. He just asked me to say that. Um, on the 8th of December 1972, myself and Louis were busy working in the butcher shop in Derry Lynn. And Captain Rees and some soldiers came into the shop. And uh, they were very intimidating. Um, they asked Louis about his gun license. And he said, I, I have licenses because he has dogs. He used to do a lot of hunting. And Captain Rees said, I hope you have. And Louis said, well, of course I have. I'm a law-abiding citizen. And he said, well, if I thought you weren't, I'd blow the head off you. That was OK. On the 15th of December, I went off as usual on my rounds around Listen Ski, Newton Butler and Dona, delivering parcels of beef. I left Louis in the shop. It was quite late when I got away. Normally, I would go earlier. But I'd been held up by something or other. And um, it was about 9 o'clock when I left. But before I left, uh, there were some young fellows in the shop, they were footballers, and they were chatting Louis, and they were saying to him, you know, you're not afraid of being robbed. And he said, I have the tools, and I know how to use them, and he lifted up one of the knives. That just struck me afterwards. I was okay, I went to my rounds, and when I was going in through Lissenski Main Street, there was a checkpoint. There had been a bomb in Lissenski earlier in the night, in the daytime. And uh, the soldiers came over to the van. We had a van at the time. And we had it lined for beef and uh, other hens and what have you. And the soldier went to open the back door. And I said to him, don't open that door because I have live turkeys in it. That was all right. I went on my rounds. And I uh, was coming back through Listen Ski about 11 o'clock and came out the Darling Road. And as I did, uh, a car came up behind me. And there were Ninos. There was hands wagging me down and so on. And uh, this soldier, policeman came up with a gun and he looked in and he said, oh, it's a woman. And I said to him, did I kill somebody? I thought I'd run somebody down in the town. And uh, I can't remember what he said, but I drove home and I was quite anxious, I can say, because it was very intimidating. When I got to Derlin, the shop was darkened and um, I went over to what was then Lynham's Hotel and... Uh, I asked this neighbour, did you see Louis about? And he said, why is he missing? And I said, no, he's just not in the shop. I knew it was very unusual for Louis to have left the shop. Because it was the 15th of December, we had a lot of uh, orders put up. It was the mouth of Christmas. So I came out onto the street, and I met the late Mrs McManus, and she called me over, and she said, are you looking for Louis? And I said, I am. And she said, he's gone off with some friends. And I said, oh, that's OK. So uh, I went down home and I whispered to my brother, because I didn't want to upset my mother, I said, Louis's not in the shop, and will you come up and we'll check? And so we went up anyway, and we shone the light in through the back, and we saw his coat hanging on the hook. So I thought, well, he must have gone off somewhere. We went over then to Dona to Hugh's brother to see if he was there, and we came home, and there was no sign of him. So I went to bed and I warned my mother to wake me early in the morning that we'd report a missing. Because at that time, people were found behind ditches and hedges, and I was convinced that that's where he was. So I wanted to report a missing to get the police out to search. So my sister, who had come home from Australia a week previously with her family to relocate to Ireland, came with me down to the police barracks about 9 o'clock in the morning. And the policeman said, oh, he's probably gone off with another woman. Definitely the wrong answer. So he never made any effort to 
come out to look for him or anything. He took it all very flippantly, and um, we went back home and went over to Kiernmore to the, you know, his home place, and uh, picked up the who, Jerry West, who's since deceased as well, and Louise, and came back to Derry Lynn, where Louis had been found in the fridge, murdered. Um, that was all right. Uh, we managed Christmas quite difficultly with a lot of help, and uh, we were all traumatized, of course. But uh, about six weeks after he was found and after the funeral and all, um, I said to Detective Inspector Wormsley, you know something, I'd love to talk to Captain Reese because I said he said he would blow his head off, and a week later his head is blown off. So he said, well, I'll bring him. I said, good. So he came to my mother's house where I had gone back to live with my son, and he brought um, the, uh, Detective Inspector Wormsley and Inspector Millen was the other man, and Captain Reese. So the house is very small, and there's a lot of people in, and we went down to the kitchen, and I took a friend down with me. And I said to him, you know, it seems to me very strange why, how you said you'd blow Louis's head off, and it would happened a week later. And he said, well, you know that house name and a house next door. I'm there at 5 o'clock in the morning, blah, blah, blah. And I said, and can I ask what you're doing there? Well, he said, work out for yourself, keep an eye on you. That was all right. I said to him, um, how would you feel if I was your wife with a four-month-old child standing in front of you? And he said, keep your chin up, worst things that happen. I can see him as clearly as day. He was totally lacking sympathy, lacking anything. He just didn't give two hoots, nor did he care that I knew that he didn't give two hoots. Um, he was interviewed by the HET report, as Brian said. He's living in France. They brought him over from France to interview him. But I'm sure he doesn't remember anything. Not a thing. Can't remember a thing. He suffered Alzheimer's, supposedly. So that's all I have to say. God love you, Betty. And you can feel the, the hurt and the pain in this room tonight. And um, it's been an emotional evening. We're going to... Um, and Betty and the Nan and Murray families and everybody who lost loved ones as a result of the conflict, our hearts go out to you. And the, that lack of hum, humanity and compassion um, is goes right across right across the board. And we've it, there's not a county in Ireland that doesn't understand how that feels. Um, I think I'm going to take James now for a few words, if that's okay. Are you able? I feel very inadequate following two speakers before me here. But good evening, everybody. And on behalf of the Nan and Murray families, I would like to thank you all for coming here and supporting the family at Michael and Andy's 50th uh, anniversary vigil. It's heartening to know that the people of Newton Butler and the surrounding areas are not, to preferred, are not prepared to forget the atrocity which took these two young men's lives a half a century ago. I'm not going to go back into the details of the brutal murders and the subsequent trials and convictions of the soldiers from the 1st Battalion of the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders. Most of you will have heard, read, and seen the documentary long before now. But I want to pay tribute to Brian MacDonald, our local historian, for the countless hours he has spent researching and studying the most minute details of this case to provide not only the families, but the Irish people with the facts that would have never surfaced whether it is persistence, diligence, and professionalism, despite all the obstacles deliberately put in his way. From the bottom of our hearts, we thank you, Brian. I have no doubt you won't leave any stone unturned in the continued pursuit of justice for Michael and Andy. A special welcome, too, to Betty Leonard, 
who 50 years ago today would have never imagined the life-changing event both she and her family were going to witness in a few weeks in early December. Her husband's body was found cruelly dumped in a freezer in his butcher shop in Derlin. Louis was also a young man going about his daily business when he met with his death. Unfortunately for Betty and her family, nobody is ever charged with the murder. Our thoughts go out to the Leonard family when they will also commemorate Louis' death in a couple of weeks. I would like to thank the Louis Leonard Common in Newton Butler and in particular Chairman Martin Sweeney for their hard work in organising this anniversary vigil this evening. Evan has been done in a sympathetic and caring manner, making sure that the families were engaged in all aspects of the arrangements along the way. It's greatly appreciated by us all. Thank you very much. I was in 1972, I uh, was age 16, and on hearing of the horrific murders of Andy and, um, and Michael, I felt compelled to put pen to paper. Um, 50 years on, um, those thoughts remain embedded in my mind, and I'll share them with you now. Michael and Andy, two innocent men, were fatally stabbed in Otnahinch Glen when cards came on them and then did embark to carry out murder some time after dark. The people of Newtown found it hard to believe as the awful news spread, they sobbed and they grieved and thousands arrived to pay their respect and honor two friends they will never forget. We're going to just, uh, while Michelle's coming back in, just going to open it to the floor if anybody has any uh, questions or anything that they want to uh, ask Brian or Betty here. I think that was very, very uh, detailed uh, talk by Brian here. Uh, One thing actually that I, 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 I got to mention was on the day of the funerals, the actual, the GOC of the British Army in the north, um, Lord Wilsonham flies over Newton Butler, actually flies over the funerals, but he's heading for Crumb Castle and he makes a speech or whatever, you know, da, 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 about, about Robin Bell's death, you know, which fair enough. But it took a journalist then to say to him, and what about Nan and Murray? He had to be pushed on it to actually even mention them. And it was, uh, he, he was actually the chair of the security committee at, at the time who had, who had orchestrated and who had designed this operation along the border that ended with that uh, tragedy. So I just thought it was interesting that it was at that level. It was at that level, a very, very senior level. Clearly he knew as well. Okay, is there any questions or any? Yeah, John? Very moving evening tonight, excellent uh, presentation. Just at that time, Brian, uh, was there much uh, political representation or any political representation made about uh, uh, the, the, the murders at that time? Did uh, either or South? Did it, uh, it, 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 it got to snippet in most papers. It was, it was quite amazing. Of course, it was, uh, there were a lot of deaths in 1972. It was, I think it was probably more deaths in 72 than nearly any other year during the entire conflict. But even at that, uh, there was uh, extensive coverage, obviously, in local papers, particularly the anglo Celt did quite a big uh, coverage on it. But no, no, and there was no... No political furore, there were no questions asked, you know, and it's the silence around it. When you go and you look at the contemporary media, 
um, accounts of, of the period, it's remarkable how little is there. It, it was just a footnote. Just another, it, it's, and, and yet, and yet the, as, as, um, as you were saying, the, 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 the term the pitchfork murders w was deliberately chosen deliberately chosen because of the horror it conveyed, you know, and uh, you'd imagined for that reason alone that a lot of the papers, but it wasn't, I suppose, the same kind of uh, headline-y kind of papers that the, that there are today anyway, you know, but no, no, it was remarkably how little coverage it got at the time. And that extended to council as well, there was the, the council in Fermanagh that never come up with discussion. I doubt there was any more. I know that the workers stopped the workers stopped in Adria, in Lisnaski, and in different factories, and in Enniskillen and all. They came out on the thing, and, and, and the roads, the, both sides of the road from Skate to Newtown were apparently lined with cars, people heading to the field. It, it really, and, and, and some of ye can talk better, I know my late wife, she was at a concert for the internees that night on the, in, in Lisnaski when the word came through about what John had discovered, and, 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 and she remembered the shock and horror and coming out from the concert with her father. And it was, um, and wasn't there a UDR patrol coming down? With, I think Roy Kells was, would have been the command, commander at that stage. And her father saying to her, she remembered her father saying, I wouldn't be surprised if those boys had something to do with it. You know, so, and I think that that was, it, that was probably a, a general feeling. But no, I don't remember any motions in the council. Of course, the, the construction of the council would have been very different at that stage due to the gerrymandering and, and, and that there. You said the first government of the colonial dissolution was to divide, but then an end for the Irish government to put in laws to. For, for what? What did the Irish government put in laws to, to do what? What was the. Oh, was the I, Irish government introduced uh, obviously the offences. Fences Against the State Act, which was already in place, but they, they introduced lots of additional um, legislation during the 1970s, including, of course, the infamous Section 31 of the Broadcasting Act, which was a, a set about censorship and that. There. So, so it was about silencing um, any, any, any kind of criticism from south of the border. Uh, that, that's what they were interested in doing, and in making people... Um, look inward and, and, and frighten people in the south really away from involvement or caring about the north and it worked it worked is it likely that true harris will be dragged into proceedings apropos the alternate the bombings uh, and I see that the Kevin Mon and Garvey are looking for information. Yes, I know, and, and, and that's what I said. It's really encouraging that they are, and I but hope. Perhaps it's yeah. the yes. Yes. in the first instance. But as in the case of Michael Mann and Andy Murray, it's, it's been able to separate again. There, there will be the efforts in the establishment to separate them from this, as there has been in the Dublin bombings, and that there, there's always been deniability. Um, you know, you saw, I saw the case last week of Julie Livingston, the young girl killed by a soldier with a plastic bullet in 1981, and her records are locked up until 2064. You know, it's, it's, it's just crazy stuff, you know, and it's, and it's about stopping the And of course, that's what the legislation, the legacy bill in Westminster is designed to stop these questions being answered, to stop um, senior officers, because really, the, 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 the ordinary run of the middle soldiers were following orders, you know, as the soldiers in Belson or whatever, you know, they were doing a job. But the decision makers at a political level, no, they're not going to leave themselves exposed. I have no confidence that Major Jeremy McKenzie, whatever we find out, I don't believe he'll ever stand a day in court or will ever be properly questioned, even though, even on the basis of, of his statements to date, he could be done for misleading, for, for, for uh, attempting to pervert the course of justice. There are so many charges that could be brought against him for the deliberate um, um, lies that he, that he has told over the years. So um, that's the thing. I just wonder, will you be updating your book, Brian, with the new information that you have? 
Certainly, it certainly was, and, and of course the book wasn't published by me, the book was published by uh, the local common here, and it would be unfair, obviously, the, the burden of going to print again, but absolutely, I, it's, it's, it's a project that has never left me. I continued working on it until the documentary was made in 2016 with um, Deglin on T.G. Carr. I think the documentary might be shown here afterwards. Uh, and, and, and Daglan put a lot of work, it's interesting, just a, a wee aside, the documentary, right on the day of the broadcasting, there were still lawyers in TG Carr wanting to pull it. They made him, they made the program makers, Daglan and them, associate the um, Robin Bell, Robin Bell's killing with the killing of Mike and Ann. And I, I'm always uncomfortable about that. Of course, the two are always going to be associated, but they were two totally separate events. And by having them in, in the one program kind of creates or, or re reinforces that, that there was some sort of a link between them. There wasn't. They didn't give a toss about Robin Bell, these soldiers. They, they, they laughed at the, uh, at the UDR soldier. They, they weren't real soldiers to them. You know, so, so um, yes. I don't know that I answer that at all. <laughs> the, only, the only thing I remember is uh, Michael and Anne giving us a lift home from last that day. <clears throat> um, that was at 12 o'clock. And the soldiers were on the farm at 12 o'clock that day. Yes. Absolutely. Well, according to Major Jeremy McKenzie, you're wrong. <laughs> And in fact, Michael had actually said that he was a bit concerned after Robin Bell and he saw all these soldiers. Well, he, he was worried when he left us off that day to one home. Yes. He was worried what might happen to him, right? Mm -hmm. And furthermore on that, uh, I know what channel of it, but I don't know that I've seen that the police. And he was followed from the farm to his house on the hill in Newton Road. The car left the farm and drove up to his house, stayed up after him to the house, and then he said the other he confronted the sergeant and listed the ski for to tell the truth, right? And the sergeant said the lips were seized. Oh. That was, that was it was interesting that Michael was, uh, in friendly terms, that uh, another an RUC man here, uh, Crilly, was it Crilly? Yeah, and that he was actually friendly with him, and he offered to come and give evidence of having seen the activity coming from the barracks in that time. Um, he, 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 um, obviously, he was sh shot dead by the IRA, so he never got to do that. But uh, it was interesting, and, and I think he had another neighbour called Alan, Andrew Allen, was it ever? Seen? So he wasn't on... William Allen, so he wasn't on bad terms with his immediate neighbours or whatever, you know. On the other hand, there was a neighbour directly across the road called Tom Wilde, right? Yes. <coughs> in all of that, Tom Wilde was never interviewed. And Tom Wilde would be out every single man in the 70s or whatever it was, out feeding cattle, and he was never interviewed. <coughs> uh, yeah. And then, before the candle light, my daughter was doing some research on it, and she was speaking to that reporter. Theory, or he came up with evidence that a white car had left the, the clean up squad, had left the farmyard that evening and drove out to Crow. So your thing is coming through. Right. On the Monday evening. <coughs> Hello. Uh, you just mentioned there are two UDR men who were supposed to be involved. Uh, old uh, little. Uh, he all of a sudden left the b men and became a major in 1970, which was very unusual. But in 1972, he was a major. For 1973, he was demoted to a captain. <coughs> so wonder had that anything to do with what happened in Alan Murray. Also, in 1981, he was highly decorated, and he was mentioned in dispatches during the months of February, March and April. Yes. And those were the three months of Bobby Sands' election. Yes. When the UDR run amok through this county, pulling down posters at night, uh, 
holding up people, searching houses, and so on. He was also uh, on the Registration Association, Unionist Registration Association, and I used to go to the National Registration Association, or secretary at that time. And uh, on many occasions, he targeted families, in particular the Lynch family. Every registration, each year, a number of the Lynches had to appear because he objected to them. So it was obviously he was working, fighting out on other Republican families. Uh, as for Forster, he came in in 1970 as a lieutenant. He was promoted in 1971 on the 12th of July. He was promoted captain in 1973 on the 12th of July. And then he was promoted major in 1978 uh, on the 12th of July. So, <laughs> there's something very usual, unusual there, where the, the British Army were able to, you know, yes. convince them and get around them. Yes. But according to the book, Edmund, Ed, Edmund Burke's book, he makes the point that we knew that that. that the information come from the UDR was motivated sometimes by spite of neighbours or whatever, and it shouldn't be taken seriously. It, shouldn't be, it should always be treated with caution. So his point is that there was a, a, a failure on the part of the Argyles on this occasion to properly interrogate the information that were being given, because of course um, it, that it was coming straight from, from UDR with a very personal vendetta in this instance against the victim. The censorship now left in Ireland, yet the press, the print media, the, the RT, BBC, UTV, and pound Republicans about things you know that happened even without evidence for Republicans were prepared enough. And yet, you were mentioning a major would, would not be a general in the British Army. Will there be anything about this tomorrow or next week about from RT or Liam of Martin or anything? To no. Say, no. <laughs> no, well, no, and I don't. I think that, unlike myself, you can, I, with me, you can't take feathers of a frog. He can sue me all he likes, and I'd happily, happily face him in court. I wouldn't give a toss, because, because, <laughs> <laughs> and, and that was, that was, that was the concern, actually, Kevin, of T.G. Carr, of the lawyers in T.G. Carr, when they were doing the programme, because it was coming so close, but, Edward Burke and his book comes every bit as close. He says that everything about this operation suggests that somebody more senior had to have given the order. You know, he is saying that there, and he's writing a history with the cooperation of the Argyles. And uh, it, 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 so he had access to stuff, and he is saying this could not have been a rogue thing. Of course, the, 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 the intensity, the, the dreadfulness of how they did it, the multiple stabbing that there, the coroner said, as if someone went berserk. And that was part of the protection, that this had to be a crazy. This wasn't somebody who was a controlled, a, a soldier, a disciplined soldier. This was a crazy person. And in fact, Hathaway tries to play the crazy card in court. He, he kind of has an episode or whatever, you know, and because uh, he's, he, well, he was so, so annoyed, I think, at having to, having to plead guilty. It's interesting, many years later, he, um, I, th I think that you might have seen a couple of them in jail when you were on remand, uh, going down the stairs. Anyway, but I know that uh, Sean Kinsella from Clonus, too, he was in jail in England, and, and Hathaway was in the, in the same prison at that time. So it's amazing how paths cross in life later on and, uh, and, and, and as I said, and truth has a way of coming out over time. But you know, I, I am content that we, we, that we know the story. I just wish that I got talking to Patrick Gilligan or even Barney Gilligan might have known something. Or, you know, would he have talked to him or, or, or um, some of the other people who were centrally involved at the time? Um, but, but, of course, we've lost all of that. And as I said, they have destroyed most of all the operational records were, de were destroyed. All of the operational records from around that operation. If that doesn't say a cover-up, nothing does. Gormila Mogad, Brian, and apologies for having to, to step out a wee minute. Um, I think that has been a really 
harrowing evening, to be honest with you, both hearing it firsthand, and I've heard Betty's story before, but every time you hear it, it just, it doesn't get any easier. And I want to thank Brian for, for bringing Andrew and Michael's story to this community tonight, to the Michael Leonard Common and Martin Sweeney, the chair, for organizing this event tonight. I'm sure, and many of us, I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder a number of years ago. I'm sure that many people in this room have it and maybe haven't been diagnosed. But tonight is going to be, there's, you're going to go home and reflect on what you heard and it's not going to be easy. So I want to say to everybody here tonight, mind yourselves and mind each other. And John and Beanie, is that right? <laughs> and you know, do the, the, there are there are still difficult days to come? And the problem in 1972, when Andrew and Michael were murdered, there was another thing and another thing and another thing, and we didn't get the chance often to grieve or to process or to deal with the trauma. And you had one trauma on top of another, and you were just parking it. And at times like this, at an anniversary or at a, a particular moment in time, that trauma can manifest itself again, and you could find. It's very difficult. So I want to say to everybody here, if you are struggling with your mental health, there are lots of places to go and, and numbers to call and all the rest of it. And I think we do need to be cognizant of that, that there's a lot of suppressed feelings and suppressed memories here in this room tonight. And there'll be a lot of people going home feeling very dejected. I want to say one other thing. We know what a shower British, British administrations have been over the years. We know the influence that MI5 and the, the um, special forces and all the rest of them have been in Ireland, not just in Ireland, but around the world. We know what they're like, but it still, it still hurts when we see how determined uh, Dublin governments are to quell and quash the truth as well. And, you know, the, the Brian talked about 1972 and bringing in Section 31 and all of that. They mightn't, we mightn't be getting pitchforks stuck in us now, but you see the, the abuse that Mary Lou MacDonald is getting and the gaslighting that she's getting right across the media for RTE to have a one-hour programme if it wasn't called 100 Reasons Not to Vote Sinn Féin. It should have been, because it, that's all it was about. And the Irish government are really a, a concerned. Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael for 100 years have run the 26 counties and haven't run it well either. And we have got to change. There's, we, have a, we have a lot of work to do over the next weeks and months ahead. But I know people who have a Republican ethos and spirit who would have the same principles and the same integrity as ourselves. And some of them feel afraid to join Sinn Féin or to put themselves forward as a Sinn Féin representative and especially if they live in areas like North Antrim and places like that. So don't be surprised when you see the abuse that goes on in the media that if they can stop you know gifted people from coming forward and saying I want to play my part um, in Irish unification that that a lot of that abuse is to do with that. Um, we have luckily and Brexit has I suppose dealt us a hand that we have to use in terms of how the North, which was a failed state for a hundred years, is now so failed and so dysfunctional, it's never going to work. But we need to, we continue to need to make our voices heard. So while we've heard Brian's voice here tonight and we've listened to the story and we've empathized with the Nan and Murray families, we have still a job of work to do. And I want to thank everybody for coming here this evening for their support over the years. I know many, many of you, and we've been up lanes and we've been, we've been you know, roundhouse in the States and we've, we've knocked doors over the past 30 odd years that I've been involved in politics or whatever it is. So I just am deeply honored um, and privileged to represent this amazing community of people who have never let the combined forces of the British and um, elements within the Irish governments to hold you back. And you've, this, is the, this is the constituency that elected Bobby Sands in 1981. Be proud of the work that you did then. Every single one of you is, and I know there's a lot of people here in the room tonight who were involved in that campaign. Fermanagh, South Throne, and the people in this county have really played their part, and it is an honor to be working with you. And I just want to say, I think Tom has a couple of presentations to make, and I just want to say thank you to everybody, and genuinely, please God, mind yourselves, safe home and look after one another. Gurmila Mayagov.
Okay, thank you, and I'm sure you'll all uh, agree with me. Three speakers here who have uh, given us an awful lot of information tonight, and uh, we have history being unveiled. As you're sitting here, there is always a story behind the stories, and it is only by people like Brian and Betty coming to places like this uh, and recounting what they know that we'll get that history. So just to mark this uh, evening and the event that we have just had here, I'd call on Jim Carson now, uh, Chair of the Common. Jim, if you come on up here. And Jim is going to make a, a presentation. We have got uh, some of these uh, framed photographs uh, just specially done to mark the occasion. So the first uh, presentation I'm going to ask Jim to make is to Michael Nan. So Michael, if you want to come up here and get uh, uh, James Nan, sorry, James to come up here and uh, get. Uh. And then our second uh, presentation is to Brian McDonnell here, Brian that has done so much work and uh, has brought this uh, event here for us this evening. And our next presentation is to Betty Leonard. Betty, and thank you for coming along here this evening. And the next presentation is to John Hanna. John played a major part in, in the history of what we have been talking about here tonight. So thank you, John, for coming along. Okay, and we have uh, one of the frame photographs, obviously, for Johnny Murray, who couldn't attend here tonight, and that'll be, Jim will present that at a later time. We have our next presentation here now is to Michelle Gildenew, who chaired our event here tonight. Okay, so that concludes this uh, section of our event here tonight. There are some of the books available at the back of the hall there for five pound or a donation, but there is also the showing of the documentary as Brian referred to earlier on. Uh, so anybody who wishes to uh, is uh, uh, very welcome to come along, uh, stay along and watch uh, that documentary. Can I just, uh, as well as Michelle thanking people here, there was an awful lot of people that worked very hard uh, from the common, all of the common members here, led by Martin Sweeney, who took the lead in working with Brian and working with everybody to make sure this happened here uh, tonight. Also very ably assisted by Kevin Lynch and Stephen and John Feely, all members in the uh, Cola Cantor to be able to help us here and to uh, make this night a success. Can I thank everybody that spoke here tonight? Without your participation and you coming along, that wouldn't have been uh, the help. Can I once again thank Rose Connolly for her lament and... <laughs> Also, the Sheridan family for the music at the start here tonight. And, of course, Father Joe for the uh, prayers up at the church. And also, uh, we have uh, many ladies, Martin, Angela, and Gabriel. Uh, all the people were, and Pauline, working there to do the teas and coffees in the, uh, in the back of the hall here. We have... Pat McCabe doing the uh, video in here. So, yeah.
Yes, this will be up on YouTube here uh, when Pat gets this all edited and, and uh, worked out. I also want to thank uh, the Newton Butler Development Association here, Community Development Association in particular, uh, Paul uh, McLaughlin here. Uh, Paul is the man behind the uh, cinema that is hopefully going to uh, show our DVD after this. So uh, with that, uh, I just want to... Uh, invite anybody that wants to to stay along and uh, watch the video uh, otherwise thank you all very much for coming along <laughs>